Yeah, if we could, everyone who, who was part of the, the crew on this. Yeah, we did Okay, uh, well, why don't I hand you the mic, and uh, uh, down the line you can introduce yourself and uh, tell everyone what you did on the film. Hi, Amy Show, producer. Uh, Andrew Park, I was the stereographer. Uh, this is I'm um, the writer and director. Woo! Okay, uh, so uh, uh, Simone, I'll start with a question for you. Uh, as both writer and director, uh, what inspired the story? Where did where did the film come from? What were the, the um, here? The original idea came uh, from the early videos that that freelancers and parkour started to put on the internet, and. Uh, I, I was fascinated by what they were able to do, and I wasn't able to do for the rest of my life. So it is <laughs> unbelievable. The, the, the thing that was incredible at that time was, it was a few years after The Matrix came out, and these kids were doing the same action that I saw in that movie for real. And I thought it was very interesting, and I dig a little bit in their culture, and I discovered that actually it wasn't just, you know, extreme uh, action, but actually, uh, there was a philosophy behind it, and I found fascinating the fact they were putting together two elements. One element was uh, the idea of expressing yourself through your body with uh, uh, the environment that you have around, whatever it is, and to consider the obstacles an opportunity to express yourself instead of preventing you to express yourself. And that approach is the approach that they have uh, for their life while they, you know, they do free running and parkour, but also uh, um, in, in their life, how they live every every moment of their life. And I thought it was very interesting, could it be an interesting theme to play with. An opportunity to have a movie that has action, but also the action means something. It's not only put on the screen to make the movie more exciting. It's actually part of the life of the characters. And that's how I started to uh, investigate more. And I, I, I play a little bit with the theme of what does it mean to be free? You know, someone that can, you know, drive around, doesn't have roots, doesn't have any real connection, but actually is in a cage, and it takes a while for them to understand that they need to break that cage to be real free. And to be free is actually to stay full with the people that you love. If you cannot do that, it's not real freedom. So that was the, the final message that I was playing with. It seems like a, a, a number of the roles were quite physically demanding for the actors. So how did you go about casting actors uh, who could handle the, the physicality of the role? Well, the, um, the protagonist, William Mosley, uh, the problem with him is actually to keep him quiet and not have him running around as crazy and try to jump from every building. Uh, he, he has actually was trained as a gymnast before becoming an actor, so he really loves doing all the trampling stuff and, and jumping around. And when I saw him the first day in the gym training for, for the movie, really we couldn't stop him. And that was the problem on the set, that he wanted to do all the stunts, even the one that he, he wasn't supposed to do. So um, that was a, a relief because he embraced completely the, the character and the project. And so on one side it was very easy. On another character like Kelsey, Kelsey Chow, she, she plays Emily. Um, she has a perfect body for, for the, 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 the character, but she never did it. So actually she achieved a, a few things that, that nobody expected from her, uh, but she was great. Again, she embraced the project and she was there for the training every time, and she was trying very hard, and, and at the end I think that you see the result on the screen is, is very good. So uh, we were lucky, to, we're lucky, we're looking for, for the right people, of course, but the main element for me was the performance as an actor. And then I thought, you know, uh, I hope that they are going to be uh, trained or we're going to solve the problem. Actually, the surprise was that we didn't have any problem on the set while they were doing all these stunts. Yeah, actually, the other thing is that Tempest Running is the team that did the stunt, the, was the stunt coordinator and design all the stunts. They trained them before the shoot and then, uh, of course, they were, you know, the stunt coordinator on the set, they are phenomenal, they are the stuntmen that are doing so many, you know, all the Spider-Man movies, Superman, that you see them around. Uh, they are, uh, they, they, the stances are in the free-running or parkour style, 
they've done all, all by these guys that are just fantastic. Uh, Victor Lopez and Paul Darnell, they're, they're phenomenal. And I was lucky enough to meet them while I was doing research about this movie, so a few years before, before they became you know, the point of reference for the entire world of, of movie making. So they were attached to the project even before it was written, they loved it, and we, we grew up together, kind of. Their dream was to open a gym about free running, and my dream was to move, make a movie about it, and pretty much the two things that happened simultaneously, so it was great. A lot of the other guys, as you can see, they're um, not primarily actors, but primarily stuck at uh, parkour guys, which right, is right. maybe what you're referring to. So. Um, we had an audition process in New York when we got there. Um, Craig Henningsen, who is an actor, but also a dancer and stunt performer, was awesome, so he played Mark, and he was perfect for it. And then the other guys, we did an auditioning process pretty quickly. We did a really quick prep on this movie. Um, we were gonna shoot in LA and then had to move to New York at the last minute. Um, we did an audition process over like two days in New York and brought in pretty much every stunt, every parkour person that we could come up with and did a big casting process and it was an interviewing process that was really interesting. In the office they came in and told us why, what parkour meant to them and okay. how special it was to them and like the stories were kind of amazing. We have like some great behind the scenes footage on the DVD if you guys check it out. Um, yeah. But, uh, and that's how we cast those other three guys that were really authentic, not the, you know, Right. Best actors on the planet, but they're um, really authentic, and I thought did a really great job. And what was the street to screen contest? I know. Yeah, we um, we did that the the summer before the film came out. We wanted to start marketing the movie and doing a publicity, so we did through a Facebook contest. We put it out, and we put it out to every parkour group across the world. Basically, we had a lot of submissions, and we told them their um, prize would be to be at the end of the film. Ah, so that's okay. what that was. So cool. the footage at the end of the film were all contest. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. Yeah. You've got this movie. Uh, it's an action parkour uh, shooting on location, and you decided to do it in 3D. How did how did that happen? <laughs> just that. Uh, many people. <laughs> um, I actually had just done a, another 3D film, and 3D was kind of. But, you know, it's kind of waned a little now, but it's still, you know, a great marketing tool, and it was still very hot. And one of my financiers at the time said, hey, you know, I'll give you X amount of dollars if you do it in 3D. And I actually was really psyched about 3D, because I had just finished another low-budget film in 3D, and it really enhanced the story. I don't think for every film it enhances it, but we are here at the 3D Club, and, like, I think that it's an awesome device for the right story, that it really can make a film a lot cooler, and we thought this would be really cool. Hey, 3D and, and parkour oh, sure. yeah, and 3D. Yeah, yeah, no, so, no. I, it, so it, it was a financing. Sounds like it would go together. It's a really financing well. foreign sales sort of mechanism, and so we um, we we decided to go that route. Also, and it changed I, the I, way that we were going to shoot yeah. a bit and made things a little more complicated, or maybe a lot more complicated. <laughs> um, but it's cool that you guys can see it like this. I think that the film is really designed in 3D, and, and it really looks awesome in 3D. And you know, not as not as cool in 2D, but it, but it still works. <laughs> In, I remember actually, I was thinking about that today um, because all the time we were thinking that was the model. But I remember actually the first time we met in Venice that we were talking about it. And you told me about your movie that you finished in 3D. It was the first time that we started thinking about, well, these could be done in 3D. And I think that in some way we always had that idea in the back. And then when actually the financing came through, it reinforced that, that commitment to, to make it in 3D. But in some way, for, for the subject and for the story and for the technology that was becoming available at that time, it was kind of a perfect storm to, to put together. And um, the element is that something that I, I try to teach also to, to my students and, and sometimes to explain also to, to people that are uh, talking about, I don't want to see a movie in 3D or, or it doesn't make any difference. Well, I think it makes a huge difference when you shoot in 3D. Uh -huh. Because you design the shots in a way that is enriching the story in 3D. And there are a few, lots of actually elements that when you watch, when you frame in 2D, you uh, highlight certain elements. Because in 2D, they're going to be seen and experienced in a certain way. But when you shoot in 3D, there are other elements that are uh, enforced by the fact that you have the Z-axis to, to play with. And so the running experience is totally different when you have something coming or going away from the camera in 3D is much more rich than actually when you shoot in 2D. So it, it affects really the way that you shoot. And 
you know, uh, choices of lenses, choices of composition, at the end, they, they will determine how you tell the story. And you cannot ignore the fact that when you're on a set, you make those decisions for the best effect that is on the scene at that moment. And if you, if you are shooting in, in 3D and you are with the glasses, with the monitor, and everything is ready, those decisions are inevitably affected by the fact that you're already experiencing the movie in 3D. And I think it's very important that, you know, in some way there is all this debate or, uh, of, uh, you know, when you can do it or, or if it's uh, affected the story. And that, you know, pretty much every story could be enhanced by, by the 3D experience, even if it's only a dialogue, if it's done in the right way. If it's considered only a gimmick or a solution for, uh, you know, for the market, unfortunately, I think that we, we saw how bad movies converted in 3D, they're killing, actually, the market for 3D, and that, that's sad, actually. I, I found it very effective, particularly like scenes where uh, uh, when Daniel's pondering how far he would have to jump to get into the doorway, and you can see the distance to get to that doorway, and it, it really emphasized uh, that what they're doing is dangerous. So when you watch it in 2D, it doesn't give the same effect. Or when he jumps from you know, the balcony in the, at the school, yeah. that scene in 2D is not as effective as, as in 2D. I, I realize that everything that goes parallel to the camera usually in 2D is much more effective as action. That's why we shoot lots of action parallel to the, because everything is blurry. Mm -hmm. But in, in 3D, the most effective stuff is when they're coming to you, or when they're going away, the way you highlight the, the z-axis, and it's the, the part that is most exciting, and it's highlighting really the distance and the depth. There is one shot that I, I use as an example, that is when uh, um, there is a final confrontation uh, with, uh, with Mike uh, uh, and Luke, and you have this kind of flat shot in, in uh, where you see the two characters, and one of them is in front of the elevator. If you watch it in 2D, that shot is quite flat, and we cut it quite quickly in, in, in the editing, because when you watch it in 2D, it's not that exciting. But in 3D is very rich actually. There's all these lights that is going around and it's very deep, it's very interesting to watch. But again, you need sometimes to find a compromise because you know that lots of people are going to watch it on in 2D unfortunately. You you mentioned you, you mentioned that the you know the technology's reached a point to allow an independent production to do this kind of work. So uh, Andy, uh, why don't you talk about what you uh, worked with on set? Well first of all, there's no wire removal anywhere. Right? There's no. There's only one digital effect, right? There, a pad in the movie. Yeah, a pad in the movie. And uh, that, was, that was amazing. That was in fact, sometimes <laughs> they do the rehearsal and they put a pad there, and then they say, "Okay, we're going to roll." And they pull the pad out, and I was always like, "Whoa, they're going to do that!" <laughs> yeah. Especially yeah. over the stairs. Like that one. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I don't think anybody got hurt, right? So shooting native 3D. Uh, what kind of cameras, what kind of rig were you using? All right, it's uh, a pair of Epix uh, with Ingenue Optimo. We had a wide and long zoom on an Atom rig. And then when we came to LA, we used a Hurricane rig with the same cameras. Uh, the Atom rig is fully motorized, the Hurricane rig is not motorized, but it intercuts well. I don't think you can uh, point out the difference between the two. John Fillion shot the stuff in LA, he's here. Yeah. Uh, Sam yeah. Chase, yeah. Is the in, in New York. I think this film's unique because I think there's more, we broke all the 3D rules, I think. Just about, we threw them all out. And that had to do with the story and uh, the subject. Um, yeah, so, uh, I've seen this on various screens and you get more or less ghosting with the, the background, with the high contrast scenes. Um, I like the real D screen, I don't know, it's depth music. Um, <laughs> Let's see. So the rig, the rig is a bit heavy, so you'll see the difference. And then the GoPro stuff, you'll see where they're wearing it. Uh, I wasn't really there for that. They would run off on our <laughs> seventh day, on the day off, and go shoot that. Yeah. At, uh, just Simone and the actors. So yeah. Were you monitoring in 3D? And yeah, I had a Marshall 24-inch monitor that had to be hardwired. Uh, so mo again, most of the movie is uh, handheld or steady cam, which is very unusual for 3D. It's a very, very heavy rig. You could hear the guys huffing and puffing under there. The steady cam guy took a week to fill up his legs, I think. I wasn't sure he could do it, but he was young enough. He, he pulled it off. 2J, yeah. he could tell us about that. Um, it, it, it was heavy, I think. With How heavy was We put it on the scale. How heavy was it with the... That's yeah, probably the heaviest camera to flow on the steady cam. Yeah. It, it, uh, well, because you, you have two cameras and two zooms, 
And I think it was upward, well, it was more like 75 pounds with the sled, I think. That was 75 without the sled. Without the sled? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so I was okay. carrying somewhere around 116, 17 pounds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So uh, it was pretty physical, and like I say, um, the camera's heavy, so there's a fair amount of inertia to it. So even when they do the handheld, it's not like you need an image stabilizer. It's just because of the weight. Uh, but it meant, uh, so I think it's a little unusual to have that much handheld and steady camera in 3D with a rig like that. And we didn't really have a B camera system because it's a smaller film. And we didn't have, we talked about the idea of having something else with a SI2Ks or something small. And we just, we had to make it work with their one system. And then we just had the GoPros. And that was, yeah. 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 Uh, had you storyboarded the film? Had you, how much pre-planning had you done? And how much uh, 3D pre-planning had you done? Um, uh, this is a tough one. Uh, we, we did a lot of pre-planning here in LA, actually. We scouted the location and we started to do a lot of uh, um, uh, storyboarding and shot listing. But we had to move to New York like, and have two weeks of preparation, three weeks of preparation. So we had to find a new crew, uh, part of the new cast, uh, an old new location in three weeks over Christmas in 2011. So uh, pretty much uh, the insanity of it was that we were really storyboarding, and most of the storyboarding are shot listing and, and drawing some diagrams uh, the night before or in the morning of the day. Because up to that, that very day of shooting, we were prepping the movie, and there was no other time that, that we could do it. So, um, and we had to change part of the script also to adapt it to new location and new situation. So there was a quite an amount of, of uh, things that we had to deal with and so I think that the second part of the movie is where we actually had more time to have really a, a real shot list and, and storyboarding. The, the 3D element for me was we did some research together and spent time with Andy and I, I tried to learn as much as I could about it. Um, in some way it was, was uh, a, a, you know, a training part, especially for the first few days, to discover what, what kind of lenses were appealing to my eye and I could use. And in some way, we always stayed between the 21 and the 40, kind of 90% of the time, and then an 80, when I was pushing you <laughs> to give me an 80. Because, of course, uh, the longer the lens, the less 3D you feel, and the more uh, probably you get, you get a different kind of feeling. But, and for me, that actually, I love very long lenses, aesthetically, was, was you know, I had to adapt my eye to, to that kind of feeling and how to do it. Um, one of the elements that was very interesting to me was to discover what, how the 3D was playing with the environment. Because in some way, you always think about the characters and how to frame them for close-up, etc. But then you have another element that is becoming dominant in the scene when you're shooting 3D is the place. That before, you know, you have maybe very blurry in the background, but now it's pretty crisp and you can feel the distance, real distances. So play with that was one of the things that I, I found more interesting and, and uh, more fascinating because it was something that I wasn't used to much. And also the element of the 3D has, um, you know, playing a little bit with, with uh, um, bringing the, the elements outside the screen a little bit. And, and uh, uh, that was part that we, we kind of decided to keep the idea of the screen as a window into another reality, so never bring anything out just in a few circumstances we, we dared to do it, but we didn't want to have the classic spike against it, uh, unless it was a funny moment like the snowball or something like that. But in other situations, we always felt that the best way to portray the story was this is a window into another reality, and that's how we, we conceived it. Why don't we open this up to questions from the audience? Uh, if anybody's got something, just raise your hand. I, I'll, I'll start with, with my version of the story, and then you know, yeah. yes. Um, well, one of the things that, of course, because we had to move to New York in, in, uh, at the last minute, was that I didn't have my DP that we, I worked with, that actually he was already trained in shooting 3D uh, a lot. So I went to New York and um, there were the opportunity, I had the opportunity to interview 
four or five uh, DP before I, I made my mind about it. And you know, short amount of time, schedule was crazy around scouting locations. And I remember that what I did, I did, I, I put some pictures, references on my on the wall of my office. They were uh, not related to the story in particular, it was just the mood that I wanted for different scenes. And I remember that um, everybody was coming in, uh, you know, uh, shaking hands and telling me about how they already did something in 3D and something that uh, they trained for and they were looking forward to doing it. And then this guy came in, shook my hand and then turned to the pictures and so I said, oh, I can see, well, you're thinking to use this for that scene and that's for the other scene? So he was kind of in sync with my idea on how to shoot it. The 3D element was kind of a, a discussion that we had after. And he never shot in 3D, he did, you know, he was ready because he did a, a, several a workshops on it, but never had the chance. But for me, the confidence to share my vision with someone actually, just by reading the script, could recognize what I wanted to do was the most important thing. So my decision was, okay, I want him because as soon as we are already linked in some way, and, and it will be the best solution for us to work. And he embraced it really right away for my perspective. And now let's hear your story. Well, we were prepping between uh, Christmas and New Year's at Off Hollywood. Yeah. And when he wasn't scouting, he would come up, and I consulted with him about all these various parameters. But when we went to shoot it, a lot of it went out the window, and he was like, I, I have to make this a 2D movie. And he would, but I will say that he and the crew, once you got them into the monitor and got them, got glasses on them, yeah. they would embrace it, and everybody wanted the 3D to work. But when it came to lens selection sometimes and a few things, he was like, I can't shoot close-ups of this pretty girl with a wide lens. Yeah, yeah and I agree with you. I mean, the alien yeah. was, had a different... Yeah. But, but th th that's what is one of the things that you need to have for the, you know, for the shooting and your aesthetic, your style. And in the beginning for me it was like, really, no more longer than an 80? Oh my gosh. So it, it, you had to adjust your eyes and your uh, aesthetic uh, style and everything to something different. And, and I think that, that at the end, maybe it took a few days, but I think at the end we did it in, in the right way. And eventually you were forcing some 3D rules, but I think that at the end, you you feel the 3D. You feel the, the what is going on on the screen, uh, and and I think the experience is enhanced by by the 3D here. Yeah, one of the a big issue, and there's been a lot of debate back and forth as to whether uh, uh, it's time to eliminate the upcharge, the 3D upcharge. for 3D yes. because that does tend yeah, to doesn't make any smaller sense. budget films. Doesn't make any sense. What's the cost? Uh, just for the glasses, I guess. Just three dollars <laughs> more. Well, initially, initially that upcharge was used to convert all of the theaters to digital projection. So it was sort of a, a, a subsidizing for the new equipment. Um, you know, now some of the majors aren't even distributing film anymore. So at this point, with everything primarily being digital, maybe it is time to reevaluate how, uh, how 3D films are paid for. No, it's pretty on Monday. Uh, any other questions? Embarrassing. Why did you have to move from LA to New York? Hmm. Yeah, good <laughs> question. Money. It's not embarrassing. <laughs> Tax credit. This town needs to get it together for the budget movies. Wow. Yeah, New York was better. Flying everyone there was cheaper I've shot than filming. That's crazy. Seven movies in New York City because of the tax credit. screenings and people are shocked to hear that anyone but the studios are doing work in 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that as more independent films get out there um, and 3D, the, the genie's out of the bottle. Digital makes it um, possible for 3D TVs and, and relatively inexpensive 3D productions. So it's, it's not going to go away. It'll, it'll ride these waves. But I think we'll be seeing uh, a lot more experimental and independent 3D 
uh, at festivals as more content's being produced. Uh, well, let's have a, a big round of applause. Thank you so much for, for bringing the and we look forward to seeing more from you in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank out. you for coming. Thank you.